you almost certainly know what events are in C-sharp. Even if you don't, you've probably used them before. What you may not know is how to create your own events. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to events and walk you through creating your own events. We will also discuss the features we can take advantage of and what the best practices are that we should know about. If you're new to this channel, my name is Tim Corey and it's my goal to make learning C-sharp easier. This channel is full of videos explaining the various parts of C-sharp. There's even a full course on building applications from scratch. I hope you find it useful. And if you do, don't forget to subscribe and hit that little bell icon to get notified when I release a new video every Monday. There's also a link to my mailing list that you can sign up for in the description below. That will keep you informed of all the training resources that I'm creating. For those of you who have found this channel useful, I'd appreciate it if you check out my Patreon page. If you become a supporter, you can get exclusive behind the scenes access. Also, everyone who's a supporter at any level will get access to the goal rewards when we hit them. Those rewards include a tour of my office, a documentary on how I make videos, and even a full course. The link to Patreon is in the description below. All right, so let's tackle events. Here we have a starter application so we can jump right into looking at events. If you want the source code for this video, the link in the description below will take you to my blog where you can see the download links for both the starter code as well as a finished code once we're done. Now what I've created is a simple banking application in Windows Forms. Now when I say simple banking application, I mean this is a sample, this is a demo, this is not production code, so don't take this and try and make it into a real application. Without, well, just start over. All right, but what this is, real simple, we have one customer. We're not going to try and create customers and all the rest. We have one customer. And we'll say who that customer is, what their checking account balance is, and what their savings account balance is. We're also going to see a list of their transactions in their checking account and their savings account. Now we have this button here that says record transactions, and that will open up this form right here, which allows us to make purchases. It's going to simulate a credit card machine. It's going to say the same name of the customer. You're going to type in an amount here and say make a purchase. And it's going to simulate making a purchase, which should go into the checking account transaction list. Now, one of the features of our specific banking demo is the idea that if you run out of money in your checking account and say you have $10 left and you spend $100, what will happen is it will look at your savings account and say, Yes, I can cover that other $90 from my savings account. So I'll move money over from savings in a checking and allow that to clear. But it will also post this message here saying you have an overdraft protection transfer of $90. All right, so normally this is hidden. Okay, so that's the basic design of this system. Just two forms and that's it. Now behind the scenes, let's look at what happens. So let's go to the code behind for the dashboard and we'll see we create the very thing. First thing we do is create a new customer object and a customer is just a class with three properties, the customer name and two accounts, two account objects. One's a checking account, one's a saving account. Again, this is where I say demo code because I would never hard code it to say, this is your checking account. What if you have two? What if you have three? What if you have different kinds of account besides just checking your savings? And what if those behave differently? Right now, they're both just account objects. So again, just demo, but I just want to point that out. All right, so the account object is pretty straightforward. We have an account name. We have a balance. Now, a balance is a type decimal because whenever you deal with money, you always want it to be decimal, not double. Because decimal is precise, double is not. And for that, I have a private set, meaning if you're outside this class, you can see the balance using the get, but you cannot set the balance. Instead, it's handled elsewhere, and I'll show you where in just a minute. Then I have this private list of string called transactions. All right, so it's private, so it can only be seen inside the account class. And this is actually the underscore here indicates it's a private backing field meaning this supports a full property. So it's a list of string, and all this is going to be is 
a string that says you made a withdrawal of this much money for this purpose. That's it. And if you list of those or a deposit of this much money for this purpose. Now this one gets a little trickier. This is the actual public property that takes this transactions uh, variable and uses it. And it's called transactions, but it returns an I read only list of string, not a string or list of string. And the difference there is our I read only list does not allow the user to make changes to the list. It just allows them to read it which is what you want because you don't want the user to make changes to your list of transactions. That's for this class to do. So we return that transactions, which is a list of string as read only that's baked into the C sharp framework that you can do that. Notice I have no set here, just a get. That's because this is going to be an I read only list. Well, you probably can't make a modification to a read only list, right? So instead what will happen is unlike normal backing fields, we're actually gonna make modifications right to this private backing field instead of going through the property. So that allows us internally to make changes to the list while externally it's read only. So that's kind of a, a side benefit of this video. It's, you know, it's just a, a little bit of extra information, but I just want to kind of explain why I was doing it that way. All right. We have a couple of methods here let's, Let's close these down so you can see them. We have two methods, one called add deposit and one called make payment. These are probably pretty standard things. Now, this is one of those areas where I, I made a deviation from where, what a normal banking application might do. Normal banking applications typically have one entry point and they just mark the, the information as either a debit or a credit. And they change the sign from positive to negative and it all goes into one kind of column. And that I find a little bit confusing. I want to kind of break those two apart. Just so it's a little more clear what's going on. I didn't like the confusion I was adding to this demo, especially when it wasn't really a part of the primary purpose we're doing this demo for. All right. So let's look at the add deposit. So that's, it's going to be putting money into this account. So the first thing it does is it adds to the transactions list. Okay. So we going to add this string and the string is deposited this amount. And this is a dollar sign, um, format. So string dot format. And then this particular format says it's going to be currency and it's going to be two decimal places. And here is the actual thing to format, which is the amount being passed in. So deposited this amount for, and there's the deposit name. That's going to be, you know, initial deposit or add more money to savings, whatever we want to call it. Next, we have the make payment method. Make payments a little bit trickier. So what we have here to pass in a payment name, which is the same as deposit name is payment instead. The amount that's about the same, but then we pass in potentially a backup account. And by default, that is null. Meaning we can not pass in this third value and it will still work because it'll put the value default value of null in that variable. This is going to allow us to have that fallback account. If we go below zero or would go below zero with a certain transaction. So let's walk this through. So first it says my balance, which is again, that, that property right here. So it's got a private set and it's got a public get. So say is if my balance is greater than the amount you want to take out, meaning I have a hundred dollars, you want 10, no problem. Let's go ahead and withdraw that information. Same basic format. It just says withdrew instead of up here. It said deposited. All right. So withdrew this amount for this payment name. It ta also takes our balance and subtracts that amount. So you have the minus equals, which says balance, the equivalent of saying balance equals balance minus amount. That's the minus equals does. And then finally we return true and then return true says this worked. All right. So that's the, the perfect scenario. The idea we have enough money. We don't ask for more than we have. 
it just works. However, if the amount is greater than the balance, and actually, you know what? We should make one change here, greater than or equal to. If you have $10 and you want to spend $10, no problem. So that's one, one um, quirk in the original. Let's go ahead and save that. All right, so we don't have enough money if we hit this L statement. So if we don't have enough money, let's check for a backup account. If it's not null, that means we have a backup account. Here's what we're gonna do. Now let's skip down to the else first, just to process what's gonna happen if the backup account is null. So skip down here. If the backup account is null, we just say, nope, it failed and return false, meaning we couldn't do it. So that's, that's just what happens if we fail this. But if we have a backup account, we're gonna check the backup account's balance plus our balance to see if it's greater than or equal to, let's save that as well, greater than or equal to our amount. So maybe we have $50 in our checking account, we wanna spend 100, it's gonna look now to see if we have another 50 in our savings account. If the two combined are $100 or more, then we can go ahead and say, cool, let's find out the difference. So the total amount you wanna spend minus what we have in our checking account, that's the amount we need from the other account. So what we're gonna do is we're going to go to our backup account and say make payment, which is actually the method we're right in right now. And we're gonna say the payment is overdraft protection. And here's the amount we need. So essentially it's gonna take that money out of the backup account, which normally in our case is gonna be the savings account. And as long as it succeeded, so it's false, the return false, I meaning for some reason the overdraft failed. It should never fail because we do our check here first to make sure we have enough money. But I just wanna put that check in there to make sure. But if it succeeds, then we add a deposit called our overdraft protection deposit into our current account, right? That's, that's this one right here. I'm gonna call this method up here and put that money from our savings account into our checking account. Then we're going to say, we're gonna withdraw the full amount from our checking account and subtract that from the balance, which means at the end, our balance is zero. Because if we had $50 in the checking account, we spent 100, we pulled 50 from savings, put it in a checking. That now means checking has 100, savings has 50 less. Then we withdraw 100 from checking, leaving it with zero, all right? And we say the transaction worked. So we have this overdraft thing happening but we're still able to process the transaction. So that's all the account does. It has a make payment and add deposit. That's pretty much it, okay? So back on the transaction, let's go back to the dashboard real quick to make sure we've covered that. So we have our customer. We first start up, we load testing data, which means I create a customer name and then a checking and savings account. And then I say, I name them. So Tim's checking and Tim's savings. And then I add deposits to both. So checking account gets an initial balance of $155.43. And that M at the end indicates that it's a decimal, not a double. If I didn't have that there, it'd try and put double into a decimal value and that won't work. So you have to specify that capital M to say this is actually a decimal value. You don't have to do that if it's a, if it's a variable, but if it's a static constant, like an actual, just, you know, typed out number like this, you have to put that capital M at the end. So we have an add deposit for our checking account and one for our saving account, both initial balances, different amounts, just kind of randomly picked. Next, after I load the testing data, let's minimize that now, I call the form wire up. And the form wire up says, all right, let's put the customer name into the customer text 
which if we look at the dashboard is you know right here. And then we'll do the same thing for the, let's wire out the data sources for the checking transactions and savings transactions. We just link that right to our read only list. And that's fine, we can do that. And then the uh, checking account balance value and the saving account balance value, they're to actually put, again, that string dot format. So we have a dollar sign and all the rest. And that's our checking account balance and saving account balance. So all that being said, it basically populates this form, these, uh, these two lists here, these three labels here, and we're all set. This, by the way, is, is hidden. Now, when we click this button right here to record transactions, we create a new transactions object, a new instance of it, which is a form, this form right here. And you pass in that customer class. So the customer class object we have, we pass that in. And then we show. And I'll get to that in just a minute. The last thing we have here is the error message click. So this, this red box right here, what happens is if you see this and you click it, what's going to happen is it's going to set the visibility back to false. It's going to close it again. So that's all that does. All right. So let's look at real quick what this transactions does and why it takes in the customer object. So right click on the transactions class, which is a form. It brings in at, through its constructor, the customer class and stores it in a underscore customer private variable. And the reason why is because we want to have that customer text dot text, the customer name to put in there. Um, so that's when we look at this right here, the customer name, that's where that goes. And then when you click the make purchase button, what happens is we take the customer's checking account and say, make a payment. It's a credit card purchase and for the amount that you specified. And then we pass in the savings account as that backup account. And we do capture the payment result. We don't really use it right now. And we also set the amount value of the field. So that's right here, the amount. We set that back to zero. All right, so that's it. Let me run this application real quick. So we start off with customers, Tim Corey, checking account and saving account balances and initial transactions for both. We click record transaction and we say, let's go 95 and make a purchase. It clears it out, but nothing else seems to happen. Okay. We're going to address that in just a minute. But if I say 95 again and 150, so it seems to kind of work, but we're not sure if it is or not. So let's look at, first of all, the events already in place, and then we'll look at creating our own events so we can kind of monitor this, this system as it works. So the first event that we see really quickly is this record transactions button. If we notice here, in this code, we have record transaction button underscore click. This is probably familiar with you if you've done any kind of Windows form or WPF work. This is a click event on a button. Usually to get this, you just double click on the button and it takes you right to code. This is some code that will be called, this method will be called whenever that button is clicked. This is the event handler. So it handles when the event is actually triggered. All right. And so we're kind of used to this, the idea that, well, yeah, when you click this button, this code gets run. But the question is, how does that actually work? How does this code actually get called? Now, I don't know if you know or not, let me close this other ones. I don't know if you know or not, but in a form, there's actually the designer.cs code as well. So you look at the form, it says that it's a partial class. Well, the reason why you have a partial class is because we actually split the class into two pieces or Microsoft has. The part that we use is the part that's okay for us to meddle with, to mess with. The part we don't use is the part that the Microsoft, that Visual Studio messes with. 
And so it'll say things like, this is generated code. And, you know, don't modify this. You see, you know, do not modify. All right. Now, the reality is you can, but it's kind of dangerous to do so. But I just want to point out in here, if you see this right here, this method, if you want to know where that actually gets wired up, come to the designer.cs for dashboard. And if you scroll down here, you'll find it. And what I can do is I can do a control F and find it, but it's right here actually. This dot record transaction button dot click plus equal new system dot event handler. And then it passes in this dot record transaction button underscore click. So it passes in the method to this click event, which doesn't really give you a whole lot of insight necessarily, but at least it shows you one level up what's happening. But let's figure out what this is and how we can create our own because this is this is pretty important stuff to kind of grasp because if you can make your own, there's a ton of stuff you can do. So let's start off by making our own. All right, so let's go to the accounts class because this is where I think we need to kick off the events. So an event has two parts to it. It has the place that triggers the event and it has the place or places that consume that event. So for example, a button, the place that kicks it off is when the mouse left clicks down on that particular item on the form, usually a button. That's what triggers the event. And then on the other side, what consumes that event or what listens to that event is the button click event code where it says, okay, open a new form or do this or that. So this is the place where I kick off a couple different events. And so let's create them. And as we do, we'll talk through what they do. So the first one I want to create is I want to create one where we say, okay, a transaction has been approved for this account. Doesn't matter if this account is checking your savings. All we wanna know is that we did something. So we, we wrote this transactions list. And the reason that's valuable is because we can listen to that event back on our dashboard form and say whenever we have a modification to the transactions list, or the balance, I want you to refresh the screen to show those new transactions. Because if you remember, when we actually opened up the, um, the, the transaction form and started doing transactions, nothing seemed to change. And the reason why, because it never knew to change. So let's create an event, like I said, for the, whenever we have an approved transaction, meaning if we're not going to approve a transaction and nothing actually gets changed, then don't trigger it. Only approved ones. So the very top of our, our public class account, I'm going to create a new, it's going to look like a public variable, not a property. And that's actually intentional and in the way you do it. Okay. This is the one time I'm going to say, create something that looks like a public variable. All right. So public event. We're going to say event handler. And I use the generic version. All right. The generic version means it has that these angle brackets here. Okay. So this seems to be the, the, the easiest way of going about it. And it's also the, um, I think the one going forward that, that most people will use. So inside here, we pass in a type that we're going to return back information about the event. Let's start really simple. I'm just going to say string. I'm just going to pass back a string of information. That's it. And we'll look what the information is and how it works. And then we're going to actually elevate that to the next level if you want later. All right. I'm going to call this event raise transaction approved event. All right. So raise transaction approved event. What that's going to say is when people listen to this event, if it gets triggered, a transaction has been approved essentially. All right. So that's all we need to do to declare an event 
handler. That's kind of that middle piece. So again, we have two sides. We have what kicks off an event, and then we have what listens to the event. In between is this event handler. That allows you to say an event has happened, and it allows you to say, it allows you to listen for that event. So now let's go down and find a place where we actually have a change to our our uh, transaction. So right here we have a deposit. So after the balance has been changed, I'm going to raise a new event. So I say raise transaction approved event. Now here's a little bit of a tricky bit. Question mark dot invoke. I'll explain this in just a minute. First thing you pass in is who the sender is. Notice it says object, object sender. So it's saying, who was the, the, what was the thing that triggered this event? Well, it's this, this class. And so you just type it this. And that usually works no matter where you are because that's who is actually sending the event. And then notice it says string E. Well, that's because we said right here that the event handler is of type string. So in this case, what we're gonna say is just the deposit name. So this deposit is what was just recently added, and that's what triggered the raise transaction approved event. Now, I said I'd come back to this, and I definitely will. The question mark, what does that do? Well, so here's, if you've seen event handling set up before in the, in the past, you may have seen a much more complicated uh, design here because they actually have usually about you have one line that assigns a new variable and then you have a null check and an if statement and if the null check is not true, then it keeps going on. So the reason why is because when we trigger events, we only trigger them if someone's listening. So there's no point in saying, hey, something new happened if no one cares. So this way it saves us some cycles, it saves us some, some data, um, saves us some processing if we don't trigger that if no one's listening. And in fact, if you were to trigger it and it's null, it, it caused a problem, it caused an exception. So you have to check first to see if this is not null. If it's not null, then you can invoke it. So this question mark, what it does is it says, if this, is, if this right here is null, stop right here. Don't do anything. But if it's not null, continue on as if the question mark wasn't there. And so that allows us to do a quick null check and immediately invoke the, the event. The reason why it's really powerful is because previously we actually had to copy us to a new variable and do a null check on it because of the fact that what would happen is there might be a raise condition where between the time we checked for null and actually then trigger the event, a person would have stopped listening, the last person would have stopped listening, and it would be null after all. And so it would cause a problem, a throw an exception. This way, it's all right in line, and it allows us to immediately continue on if it's not null, and there is no race condition. So if you see other code, that has multiple lines to do a check for this first and before you invoke, invoke, just know that that's still valid code, but it's no longer necessary code. And there's a better way of doing it. It's just this is a newer way. I believe C Sharp 6.0 was when this changed. So just note that difference there. So that's all there is. I just triggered the event to say I deposited something or I, I changed the transaction. All right, I copy this. I've got a few more places where we change the transactions. Right here, but we're not depositing something. We are making a payment. All right, so that's right there where we have the um, subtraction of the balance and the adding a new transaction. We'll raise that event again. Let's scroll down here. And again, we have this balance change. Therefore, we're going to raise that event. And that's it. So that's all the places where we have something going on where we're changing the transaction list 
and we're changing the balance. So now we can come over to the dashboard. Now in our wire up form, we can actually start listening to those events. So we can say customer, which is our, our customer object. We have a checking account. And notice down here, we now have this lightning bolt next to raise transaction approved event. All right, now you could call that instead of raise transaction approved, let's just call it transaction approved. Um, I don't like the raise. All right, so let's just back up real quick. If you make a mistake like this or, or want to tweak something, do it as soon as possible rather than trying to wait until later. All right, let's rename that. And that should rename all of them. That's great. And now we can do the transaction approved event. All right. We could drop the event off if we wanted to and just say transaction approved, but transaction approved event is a little more clear. So that lightning bolt to the left of what says this is an event. Now with an event, how you wire it up is you say, okay, that's the, again, the glue that holds the two pieces together. The I'm firing off the event and I'm listening to the event. So how you add one or more things to the I'm listening is to say, take that same event object and just say plus equals. And then notice that it's allowing me to have press tab to insert this default name, checking account underscore transaction approved event. Sure. Sounds good. I hit apply. What that does, is it creates a new private void method that takes in two things, object sender and string E. Does that sound familiar? It probably should. That was what the two values were that were being sent to this event. We sent this, which was the, the account class instance, and we sent which transaction it was. Now here it says throw new not implemented exception. That's the Microsoft standard so that we can continue on compile our code. But if you actually were to trigger this event, it's going to crash the application because you have not yet put real code in here. So let's put real code in here. The real code is going to be, we want to reset that checking transaction list. So this data source right here, we're going to set it back up as the checking account transactions, but we also first need to set it to null. This way it clears it out and that sets it back to that same list. It will reevaluate it and put the correct value there. Also, we want to grab this checking account balance and update it as well. Now let's do it again for the savings account and then we'll actually see it in action. All right. So customer dot savings account dot transaction approved event plus equals. I hit tab to create that event. And it's the same basic premise here. We're going to get rid of this. We're going to grab our savings account data source. And we're going to say the first one is set to null. The second one sets it back to that list. And finally, we need to grab and update the balance. All right. Now, again, this is sample code. There's, there's some duplication here. We, we could definitely take care of and clean up, but for the sake of this demo, I'm going to try and keep it simple. All right. So now I have the other side of the event. I have over here, the trigger. This was saying something happened. Over here is the listener that says, okay, when this particular thing happens, do this. And this particular thing happens, do this. Let's see us in action. All right. So there's our, our standard form. We'll hit record transaction and we'll say, I want to withdraw $85, make the purchase. Notice my checking account balance has now changed and I've withdrawn $80 for a credit card purchase. Let's do it again. See what happens when we withdraw. Let's do 85 this time, which is more than our checking account balance. 
Notice we actually have a few transactions now. We deposited $9.57 for overdraft protection and we withdrew $85 total from our checking account, leaving it at $0. Now our savings balance is $88.88, which I really didn't plan. That's, that's pretty impressive. Okay, so now let's draw withdraw another $85. Let me get $87. That deposited $87 of overdraft protection from our savings account and then withdrew that amount for the credit card purchase, leaving our savings account at $1.88. And notice also in the savings account transaction, we also have these as well. Now, the, the very idea that this is updating over here tells us that both events are firing. Because the only way we update the savings transactions is whenever the savings account changes. And the same with checking. And so actually in one, one um, move, so I withdrew that money, it's actually withdrawing money from savings, which triggers an event. It's adding money to checking, which triggers an event. And it is then withdrawing that whole money. Now, whole amount. Now I actually don't trigger the event twice over here because of the fact that I, I wait. Okay. I say, yeah, I know I'm doing both. I'll trigger the whole thing once the whole thing is done. Now, just in case you're curious, what happens if I withdraw two more dollars, which I don't have and I make purchase, nothing happens because I can't. So that's really all there is to events. The idea that you create this event handler, which is just so it says event handler and what type do you want returned, and then the actual event itself. Now let's let's do one more thing. I forgot to put a breakpoint here. Let's run this again. And I'll record a transaction, and it doesn't really matter. I'll just put um, fifty-one dollars. All right. So this has triggered the checking account transaction approved uh, event. So let's look at what it's sending us. It's sending us an account, which is Tim's checking account. The balance is $104.43. And it has two transactions, one of which is withdrew $51 for credit card purchase. So that's sending us the, the checking account object. We also have this credit card purchase is coming through as E. That's the item that was the last thing that just happened. That's what triggered this event. So that's the information you send back, which as you might expect, can be quite valuable. You could send back a whole class here, which we'll do soon of information. That way you can have a bunch of extra stuff coming along with this event to say, okay, this is what happened. And here's all the information around it. All right, so let's hit continue and we'll actually stop this right here. We don't need to continue any further on that. Now let's create one more event. Let's create a new event here and we're gonna call this the public event and it's event handler. And again, I do the um, of T. So in this one, we're gonna call, um, let's make it, first we'll make it a decimal, the type. And we'll call this the um, overdraft event. Okay, so this is going to be triggered whenever there's an overdraft. Now let's go down and look at the only place where there is an overdraft, and that's right here. So overdraft successful. So this is where the actual overdraft happens. So right down here, we're actually going to trigger a second event. So you have the event for the transaction has been approved, but now let's trigger another event, overdraft event, question mark, dot invoke this, and let's pass in the amount that we overdrafted. So the amount we needed, all right, 
So we're going to start with this. And now on the dashboard side, we can wire that up. So say customer dot checking account dot overdraft event plus equal tab enter. And that creates our event um, method. Now you could create it manually, so you could just you know type this all out, but it just it's so much simpler to have it create for you. This also names it pretty pretty well. So I just create it just as it is. Now in this event, let's do this. Let's say the error message dot text, and that's our label on the front of our form. So if we go to the dashboard form, this is the error message text, right? And let's put a dollar sign from here, a formatted string. So we're gonna say, you had an overdraft protection transfer of, and we're gonna say how much we had a transfer over. So string.format. This again is that um, special formatting, zero colon capital C two, that says give me a, a, a currency with a decimal point of two, and we'll pass in E. That that decimal E. That's what we're passing in. And now we need to close our curly braces there, and that should be it for that. And we'll show that. So error message dot visible equals true. Okay, so what's gonna happen is when you trigger an overdraft, we're gonna pop up this red uh, warning message on a screen saying you had an overdraft protection transfer of, just kind of call it out and let people know that, that something important has happened. So let's start this. We'll record the transactions. And let's do a, a big one. So let's say, um, oh, 17587, which is more than our checking account balance. Make the purchase. It does a transfer and says you had an overdraft protection transfer of $20.44. Now I click that and it goes away. Again, that's an event that I wired up. They just removed that from the visibility when you acknowledge it. So again, I can do another transfer and bring it back because again, I'm overdrafting um, now because I have a checking account balance of zero. Okay, so I've wired up a second event, but what if you wanted to see that on this other form? Before we go on, let's let's go ahead and make one modification to this form. It's not center parent, it is center screen. That's why it's it's um, starting up off screen. So this one starts on screen, now this one starts on screen too. There we go, that was bugging me. Okay, so let's get back to, to this. Let's add a similar label to what we have in the dashboard. So let's actually gonna copy this to this form and we'll do it uh, let's do it right down here. So I'll paste this. And instead of having this whole long thing, we'll just say, um, you are overdrafting. That's it. Why don't you just put that right underneath the button. Okay, and we're not gonna do the whole click and goes away thing. Well, I could, here. So we'll start off with it being invisible. So visible is false. And I'll add this event, error message underscore click, where I say error message dot visible equals false. So if you click on it, it sets it back to false. Okay, and now we're going to, without doing anything else to our account code, we're gonna to listen to the same event that we're already listening to on the dashboard. So when we wire up the initial, we bring the customer in, we're gonna say underscore customer dot, let's grab the well, checking account and say we're gonna listen for 
the overdraft event. So plus equal tab enter. And that creates our, our method for us. And we're going to say error message dot visible equals true. So all we're going to do is show that error message. Now I'm doing this just to kind of show you that there's, you can actually listen multiple spots, different forms. You might not even have both of them open at the same time and it's a, or visible at the same time and it's okay. They'll still fire. So let's record transactions and we'll kind of rearrange the screen so you can see both, even though you don't have to. And again, I'm going to say 175, which is over my checking account balance, make purchase. Notice both actually all three, actually one, two, and three events have fired. We had a savings account has changed its list and its balance. We had checking account that's changed list and balance, and we had an overdraft event. And the overdraft event actually fired on both screens. So that's just kind of demonstrate you can listen to an event from multiple different points in your application and have different things happen based upon who's listening and why. All right, so that's the basics of events but there's definitely much, much more they can go into and we should. So let's talk through the different pieces that we need of events. First of all, this plus equals seems to also indicate something else and it does. The fact that we can add something to this event means we can also take something away. And that's actually really important because you need to remove your listeners from an event before you destroy an, a class instance. Now there's some kind of cleanup stuff that can happen in the background sometimes, but the reality is if you don't remove your event listeners before you close a form, there may be a case where your form kind of half stays open in memory and isn't garbage collected, which means you'll actually have some uh, memory leakage in your application. So before you close out of say this form right here, what I would do is have an event for the on close where I just basically copy this line right here and do minus equals and remove this named method from the listeners. And that's just being a good citizen, cleaning up your application and making sure that you don't have a memory leak. What that also means is that while you can use anonymous functions here, meaning functions you create on the fly, you don't have an actual name to them. The problem is you can't then easily remove that function. And so therefore you can't be a good citizen and therefore you will have some memory leak issues. So, my encouragement to you is don't use anonymous functions here. Use an actual function name. And then at the close of your application, just run all the event listeners backwards. So underscore customer dot checking account dot overdraft event minus equals checking account underscore overdraft event done. Now it's no longer listening. Now you can release that from memory and make sure that the events aren't firing when they don't need to be. And it just makes things a whole lot cleaner. So that's one thing. Next, you saw when I created the event handlers, I passed in string and decimal. That's actually an uncommon way of triggering an event or what data to pass through an event. Typically you pass a class, right? officially a class instance. I'm going to set one of those up for the overdraft event in just a minute, but you don't have to. It used to be that any object you passed in here had to inherit from event args. That is no longer the case. Again, I believe it was C sharp 6.0. I'm not positive on that one, but they took away that requirement. You don't have to. There are some benefits to inheriting whatever object you pass through here from event args. 
One of them being that they can all be treated as event args. And second, you can, when you're passing the value through, uh, so this right here, you can actually say um, event args dot empty and pass in basically no event args. So you don't have any, no problem, just pass event args dot empty. That doesn't work if it's not inheriting from type event args. So let's set up a class to actually pass through instead of decimal for our overdraft event. We also want to demonstrate some stuff you should and should not do with a class. So on demo library, right click and say add new class. And we're going to call this the um, overdraft events, event arcs. So call it overdraft event arcs and we are going to inherit from event arcs. So public, there we go. Now that doesn't really add anything to your class. It's really an empty class. I'm not sure it has anything in it. We can actually take a peek at it real quick. All right, so it's got the empty method and it's got a constructor and that's it, okay? So that's really all it has in there. It's, it's really pretty much empty. So in here, we can have normal properties that we send through, but that's not really what we want. All right, I'm gonna show you why. So let's do a, a prop here and we're gonna pass through a couple pieces of information. So right now we have an amount. So let's pass in the decimal and amount overdrafted. And that's gonna be our, how much we went over our um, checking account balance. And then let's pass in, I don't know, a string and more info. Okay, and that's it. But what you wanna do is set these to private sets. Okay, and you wanna pass in through the constructor, CTOR, tab twice, pass in those values. So decimal, um, amount, overdrafted, and string, more info, and then just say amount overdrafted equals that property or that um, parameter, and then more info equals that same parameter. And then we're done. The reason you do that is because a class instance, don't forget when you pass that around, it's like writing down a piece of paper, the address to a house and passing that around. Everybody is pointing to the same house, the same part of the block, the same uh, physical address. So if someone were to make a change to that house, May they uh, open the front door and sit down in the easy chair. Well, now everybody's version of that house is still pointing to the same address, so they all see the person sitting in the easy chair. That's a problem if you're making modifications and events. Okay, and I'll explain. I'll show, kind of demonstrate that. For um, so, let's do this. Let's not make them private sets, and let's take off this constructor. We're gonna pass around full gets and sets, okay? And now what I'll do is go back to the account class and I'm gonna say, instead of decimal, it's overdraft event arcs. Now it's gonna yell at me down here. I can't just pass in this. I'm gonna say new overdraft event arcs and the amount overdrafted equals amount needed and the extra more information equals just extra info. And close my curly brace. Okay, so that's the information I pass back. Now let's go over to the two places that I use this. So let's close all but this. And let's look at the dashboards code behind and right here, it's yelling at me because it says that won't work 
because you're passing in decimal. Well, instead it should be overdraft event marks. And that works. And we're going to say E dot amount overdrafted. Okay. And then in transactions, we have to go over. This is why you do your, your events once do it the right way, because you got to change these all over the place. Overdraft event args E and nothing else needed to change there. So it should still all still work. Let's just verify that's the case. So record transaction. If we say 175, make purchase, overdraft pops up both spots. So we're good there. But now let's put breakpoints in both of these events in the listeners. And I'm going to make a modification in one of them. So let's start this up, record transaction. I'll say 175, make purchase. So the first one that gets hit is the checking account overdraft event. Let's step over this code right here. So we've written our message. You have an overdraft protection of $19.57. I go, you know what? That's not quite right. Let's make a modification to that. Instead of 1957, it's actually 3857. And I hit continue. Now it goes to the other form and it's overdraft event. And notice, let's look at E. The amount is 3857. That's what I change it to. That's a problem. Okay. In fact, let's illustrate this a little more cleanly by making the changes in the code. So if I were to say in this first event, we know now that this event fires first, E dot amount overdrafted equals, oh, I don't know, $1,020 and 40 cents. Okay. So I changed the amount overdrafted to this large, huge amount. And then over in transactions, we're just going to look at what that value is. Okay. So we record transaction 175, make the purchase. We run this, go to the E in overdraft and look and the amount overdraft is $1,020 and 40 cents. So you see why we can't have these read write properties because the first event can actually change the first event handler can change those values and affect all the other event handlers. So that's a problem. So how you solve that is by going to the overdraft class and saying, actually, we want to have, and I can't do the undo. I was trying to do that. Um, private sets. And you have to set this through the constructor. That's the only way you can set these values. Now in our accounts, instead of saying, well, set those properties here, we pass them in as parameters of our constructor. So now new overdraft args, open paren, pass the two values in, and that's it. Now notice I haven't changed my code. So right here, I try to make a change and it goes, you can't make a change to a read only property. Therefore I can't do that. Therefore I've protected now all of my values. So that if I run this, and I go to 175, no matter what happens, I look at the value and it still says $19 and 57 cents. There has been no change. So that's the benefit of having read only properties. But before you start saying you should never have read write properties, there is an exception. And that exception is you could listen back after the event. You could listen to say, did you want me to cancel this transaction? So for example, in our overdraft event arcs, what if we create a property 
prop bool cancel transaction equals false by default. So by default, that's a false, meaning don't cancel a transaction, but notice it has both a public get and a public set. Now, in our dashboard, we can say, you know what? We're not gonna allow overdrafts. So we can say error message, whoops, I'm sorry, E dot cancel transaction equals true. Okay, so we'll still show the, we'll still show the overdraft attempt, but we're not gonna allow it to go through. Now we'll rework our code a little bit here because we've already done the work of our overdraft. So let's move the overdraft up to the top here after we check to make sure we can do it. And we don't have amount needed, so let's actually move it down a little bit. So let's move it after amount needed, but before we actually do the payment. All right. We can say if. Now we create a new variable here on the fly, but instead what we're going to do is say overdraft event args args equals, and we'll take this right here and control exit out and put args in its place. So now what we've done is we've done it in two steps. So we first created the, the class instance for the overdraft event args, then we passed it in. But again, remember how, we, how this works. I have created right here a house. And all this variable holds is the address to that house. And so I have passed that address to the invoke function, which then dashboard and transactions will both get that address. And they can look at the house because they know where it is in the map. But that also means I still know where that house is, which means I can say down here, args dot cancel transaction equals true. So if you've tripped that to say now it's true, if anybody has, then return false. Remember that we return false is what we do if we can't do this transaction. So let's run this again. Record transaction. Now notice, remember I've turned off overdraft ability. So 175, make the purchase. It says I would have overdrafted $19.57, but nothing has happened to the checking account or the savings account lists or their balances because I'm not allowed to do it. Just to make this a little more like a real application, and I hesitate to do this, but I'm going to because I hate having total sample applications. Let's bring over a checkbox. And we're going to say this checkbox properties, we'll call this the um, allow overdraft. Um, let's do deny overdraft. That way true is true and false is false. And I'll show you why in just a minute. So the, the value is going to be false to start. And we're going to say um, deny overdraft ability. Let's call it stop overdrafts. That's a little simpler. Stop overdrafts. All right. We'll go to the checked property. The checked property is false. It's unchecked. So now if we go to the um, the code behind for this, this cancel transaction is actually going to be deny overdraft dot checked. So if you checked that box, we're going to cancel the transaction if it's an overdraft transaction. All right. So we're not going to, we're going to stop overdrafts. Now I check the box and I say 175, make the purchase. 
you're overdrafting, but nothing's happening. But now let's uncheck the box and say 175 and it goes through, but it does say you're overdrafting. Okay. So that's how you can actually utilize the, both the, the read and write properties of a, uh, a property to your advantage. So you can actually listen for the changes to this in your calling code to see if someone told you to stop. Alternatively, you could say continue transaction and one of them have to set to true or you could say it's set to true normally but someone has to say no, it's false, meaning stop it. So there's a lot of ways you could, you could kind of tweak that or you could have other types of properties in here, not just Booleans. You could have numbers, you could have strings, whatever you want to do. Um, to listen back at the caller side to see if you should continue or to see if you should tweak something or modify something or maybe even if you have this this uh, transaction that says, hey, I don't have enough money, you might even be able to send in a whole account back to say, well, I'll take it from here. So that's the basics of events. That's kind of the pitfalls to look out for. That's the, the best practices to to look out for and to do. Uh, make sure you remove your events if you're no longer listening to them before you close an object. You don't have to inherit from event args anymore, but if you do, um, there are some benefits. So kind of weigh that out. I would by default inherit from event args unless you have a reason not to. Um, but if you do a class and you probably should just because of all the extra benefits you can have with that class, then make sure you have private sets on everything that should not be changed. If it should be changed or can be changed uh, by one or more listeners, then that's fine. Okay, then, then allow that. But if it should not be changed, make them private sets and pass in through the constructor those values. Okay. Also, when you actually create the event, the first thing you need to do is have the the thing that sits in between, okay, remember you have the, the trigger the event and the listen for the event. And this is the thing that sits in between. This is the event handler. The, like I said, a few different ways of doing this, but this is the way that I recommend. It's the simplest and easiest to set up. It's just event handler and what the type is that you want to pass back to the caller or to the listener, I'm sorry. So you give it a name and then you just invoke it. And again, you have to have, or you really should have that question mark at the end of your event name to say, don't invoke this if it's null. So that's a really important piece. Don't forget that piece or your application will probably blow up. Not all the time, but at the most critical time, probably. So that's a, that's the overview of events. That's how to set them up. That's how to use them. And now when you come back over here to the dashboard code and you see down here, this right here, you kind of understand better what's going on. This is the listener to an event handler and where the actual event handler gets triggered is somewhere else entirely, but that's okay. We're just listening for this event to happen. All right. So I hope you got a better understanding of how events work. And I hope you're a little more comfortable now with using your own events in code in order to make your application a lot more responsive and a lot less linear in its processing. Instead of I start here, I end here, it's I listen for things to happen and I respond to them. And that's what events allow us to do. I appreciate you listening. Thanks for watching. If you can give me a thumbs up, I really appreciate it. And as always, I am Tim Corey.